I think the discussion is arriving at a very timely moment because the COVID-19 pandemic-induced crisis has led to a real momentum emerging in the EU. And I, I believe it is our collective responsibility to seize this, this moment, to put forward proposals and to build the alliances that, uh, that we need to make things happen. Let me emphasize perhaps three changes that I see occurring in the discourse and in the practice of institutions. First, I believe we are witnessing a new valuation of work. We are moving from the idea that the market should determine the value of work and set the rewards, even though certain jobs may contribute little to the common good or even have negative externalities for society, such as uh, traders speculating on, on commodity prices or on variations in exchange rates, to an idea um, that certain jobs are essential to society's good functioning and deserve, therefore, to be protected and rewarded because of the huge positive externalities that they provide to society. In food chains, including uh, with respect to farm workers, but also and especially in the care sector, in the health sector, in the welfare system, the crisis has again demonstrated the vital role of social protection in ensuring resilience of households and societies against shocks. So I think that is the first major change we are seeing. Um, we discover that many jobs that were highly paid are actually um, parasitic. Um, the paradigmatic example is the financial industry described by David Graeber as the archetypical bullshit job that we should not overvalue, but instead um, undervalue because of its toxic impacts on society. And I believe we are now valuing uh, types of work that until now have been neglected. The second change we see is that we are uh, gaining a new awareness of the importance of unpaid and often unrecognized work within the household. This work, the chores of cleaning, of buying food, of cooking, childcare, the care of the sick and the elderly, this work has been undervalued until now because mostly performed by women without remuneration and it still is largely performed by women because it is unremunerated. Indeed, historically, due to the gender pay gap and gender segregation in employment, the opportunity costs for women to perform unremunerated work within the family were higher, which explains why women mostly um, are still performing this unremunerated um, work. So we have a vicious cycle in which the gender pay gap uh, which is still important in the EU, 14%, leads to women being overrepresented in, in part-time and temporary jobs and the burden on women of unpaid, um, unrecognized uh, uh, job within the households um, is uh, imposing on women a very heavy burden. Um, this is, of course, made worse by the underfunding of public services, especially childcare. In 2019, 35.5% uh, of children below three years of age had access to childcare, but only 19.5% um, had access for more than 30 hours per week. And these figures were very low for some EU member states. In the Czech Republic, only 2.9% of children below three years of age are given access to, child to childcare. In the Netherlands, this is 6.2%. In Hungary, and Greece, it is around 14%. Now, the lockdowns imposed um, to face the pandemic have not significantly changed this um, situation. According to the European Institute for Gender Equality, before the crisis, before the pandemic, women spent 15.8 hours per week on cooking and housework. Men spent 6.8 hours, so there was a very important gap between the two, um, uh, the two sexes. And during the lockdowns, women spent 18.4 hours per week on these uh, chores, men 12.1 hours. So the gap remains important, but a new form of unpaid care work emerged, that is 
helping children manage in virtual classrooms. So that is the second change we are seeing, I think. It's the recognition that this work uh, deserves to be better valued and, and recognized. The third change is, yes, we are rethinking social economic governance within the EU. And there's a big debate, as we all know, on the future of the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, in the report I submitted to the, to the um, European Union, that will be debated in Geneva next week, uh, there is a proposal on how to revise the Stability and Growth Pact that follows academics such as Anton Hemerich, that follows the recommendations of the European Fiscal Board, that recommends that member states should be given a larger fiscal space to allow growth en enhancing expenditures. And yes, I believe we need more social investment in education, in health, in social security, in order to mitigate the tension between macroeconomic constraints under the Stability and Growth Pact on the one hand and human rights obligations on the other hand, but also to stimulate inclusive growth and the reduction of inequalities, which I add this important point, which I know is important to you, uh, Philippe, which is important to reduce the tension between growth as a way to increase public revenue and create jobs and the need to reduce our ecological footprint, including greenhouse gas emissions. The more we have growth that is inclusive, the more the benefits of growth are equally spread and go to the poorest segments of society in particular, the less growth we require to alleviate poverty, and thus the less there is a tension between growth and poverty reduction on the one hand and reducing our ecological footprint on the other hand. So these are three major developments that are taking place, and this is why we have today an important responsibility. This is a time of opportunity. However, if we ask to value better the work that is most important to the well-being of societies, if we seek to alleviate the burden of unremunerated work by women by providing the full range of public services, especially early childhood education and care that allow women to take up employment, and if we seek to loosen the macroeconomic constraints to allow member states to invest in the social sector, a number of battles must be fought. And I'd like to identify three of these battles. First, for the directive on adequate minimum wages in the EU proposed by the European Commission on 28th of October of last year. Today, we still have 20.5 million working poor in the EU, workers who are at risk of poverty, and the density of trade unions has been declining in all member states, which is both an explanation for and a consequence of social competition between the EU member states. In other terms, the tendency of member states to compete on wages, on social contributions, to improve their external cost competitiveness, as if a country could seek to remain competitive by keeping its workers poor, which I think we all will agree is a completely unsustainable pathway. The second battle concerns the child guarantee, implementing principle 11 of the European Pillar of Social Rights. And I would like to read principle 11 because I think it's, it's beautifully worded. Children, we read, have the right to an affordable early childhood education and care of good quality. Children have the right to protection from poverty. Children from disadvantaged backgrounds have the right to specific measures to enhance equal opportunities. And building on this principle 11 of the European Pillar of Social Rights, the Commission proposed on 24th of March of this year a new child guarantee in the form of a council recommendation that would guarantee effective and free access to early childhood education and care, effective and free access to education, to health, to healthy school meals each day, and to healthcare, and effective access to healthy nutrition and to adequate housing. This is hugely important because today in the EU, 23% of children, 19.4 million children across the EU are still at risk of poverty and social exclusion. So that is, I think, a second important battlefront. Thirdly and finally, we need to transform the European semester into a tool for social justice. 
This is hugely important. In fact, certain studies have shown that until 2019, the country-specific recommendations adopted under the European semester routinely recommended to member states that they cut in public services, particularly in healthcare, in the name of fiscal sustainability. That is now changing. And ahead of the Porto summit of 7th and 8th of May, the Belgium and Spain presented a non-paper proposing to build on the new social headline targets to include quantitative goals on job quality, on the gender pay gap, on accessible and affordable high quality social and educational services, including for childcare and elderly care. I think this is really important um, to make sure that these goals are met. Belgium and Spain had been proposing an alert mechanism called the Social Imbalances Alert Mechanism to be inserted in the European semester, if you wish, as a counterpart to the macroeconomic imbalances procedure introduced in 2011 to ensure macroeconomic convergence in the EU by strengthening budgetary discipline after the financial crisis of 2009-2011. Now, the introduction of this Social Imbalances Alert Mechanism could further enhance uh, the balance or improve the balance between the social and economic dimensions of the European semester framework. Social imbalances, we should remember, are not only a concern for the well-being of people, but also for the good functioning of the economic and monetary union and of the internal market. Member states should be encouraged to achieve not only macroeconomic convergence, but especially um, social convergence to ensure that they do not um, seek to achieve competitiveness in the internal market at the expense of social rights. And that is what this social imbalances um, alert mechanism should, uh, should serve to achieve. This would result in enhanced monitoring of the social performance of member states beyond the existing social scoreboard and it should lead to social in-depth reviews for countries found to be deviating from the social target set. And ultimately, what would happen is that the Council on Employment and Social Affairs, the EPSCO Council, would have the same role within the European semester as the one that the Economic and, and Finance Council, ECOFIN, um, has in the European semester. So let me close by saying that this is a time of opportunity because new alliances are emerging and new strategies are being designed. We are witnessing across the EU a very impressive movement towards the remunicipalization of public services after four decades of privatization. And, and privatization, from the point of view of human rights, is a major challenge for four reasons. First, because profitability is prioritized above economic accessibility, affordability for low-income households to public services. Secondly, because privatization means that accountability is to shareholders rather than to all stakeholders or to the general public. Thirdly, because privatization means that the short term is prioritized in an increasingly financialized economy above long-term sustainability. Fourth and finally, because it leads to the economic logic trumping social and environmental logics. So in this Remunicipalization movement, the interests of public service workers to a living wage, to collective bargaining and union rights, to economic democracy, the right to participate in decision making, all these interests of public service workers meet those of the general public to ensure that societal well being, not increase in monetary wealth alone, guides decision making. I am very proud to contribute to this. Uh, movement that EPSU is uh, central to, and I thank you again for your support. Thank you very much indeed.